I think that there are many people here who I have wanted to meet for a long time but uh, did not have the opportunity to meet. Uh, for example, on my left, uh, Umar Barghouti, we've been corresponding for a long, long time. And uh, we were convinced that we would meet each other a few years ago when the Association of American University Professors invited us to debate with others the issue of the academic boycott. But unfortunately, uh, the boycotters were boycotted by the donor agencies, Rockefeller, Ford, and, and uh, Nathan Cummings uh, uh, Foundation. Um, but it's something we'll talk about uh, tomorrow. And I think Judith Butler, who I think is one of uh, uh, my favorite philosophers, uh, has written extensively uh, about these donor agencies as well. And I think there's a lesson there for groups in Europe from what I've been hearing in the past two days and strategies to counter this. Um, I also completely empathize with uh, uh, Paul. Uh, he's been trying to get people to stand up and chant slogans. You know, we, we both come from social movements uh, via Campesina, and uh, I come from a number of social movements in South Africa. Um, and I think that when I look at you, the grim determination uh, to stay here with us, the tenacity you have shown with a dollop of humor uh, is a very good sign because we're going to need all of that in the years to come uh, in this struggle. Uh, but uh, to empathize with uh, Paul, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take off where he stops. So I'll say, Viva, Viva Palestina! Viva, viva. I can't hear you. Viva, viva Palestina! Viva, viva Palestina! Much better. Uh, we were talking about 2001 in Durban. And uh, Durban was a very important lesson for the movement. Because there we saw, and there are few people here who can attest to that, who are with us on the streets of Durban. There were people from the West Bank, Gaza, uh, even the Syrian Heights or Golan Heights. There were people from 48 uh, Palestine. There were people from the region, the Palestinian diaspora, who literally held hands with South Africans, um, who empathized with the Palestinian struggle, but also with oppressed people and their allies throughout the world, uh, whether it was Dalits from India, the Roma from Europe, uh, peasants from South America, uh, descendants of slaves uh, in North America, and this shocked the ruling classes of the world. It shocked them. Unfortunately, 9-11 happened. But that particular moment is something we must treasure. We need to counter we need to counter the rubbish that has been written about Durban as if it was an anti-Semitic hate fest. That's the favorite phrase that it's used. In fact, it was the festival of the oppressed throughout the world who deliberately and consciously put the struggle of the Palestinian people on the top of the agenda. And whatever the ruling classes try to do to distract them from that task, they fought back. In their blindness, they related to this huge movement. We brought out many more than tens of thousands of people on the streets of Durban. In their blindness, they put out posters like Arabs hijacked the World Conference without realizing the racist discourse they embarked on. Now, I say this because there's a lot to talk about in terms of the lessons of the boycott of the apartheid regime in South Africa. Many of these concrete, specific examples we will give tomorrow. And there have been people before me who've given you a really fine-grained analysis 
of the situation. I can only speak in the limited time in very broad strokes. So I want to talk about the concept of solidarity. And I choose to say this because we in Spain, in the Basque country, a country where we had the Spanish Civil War, where there were international brigades. So in modern history, there have always been moments when particular struggles galvanize millions of people throughout the world. Spain was an example. The struggle of the Vietnamese against US imperialism was another. The liberation struggles of southern Africa was a third. And we need to make the struggle of the Palestinian people for self-determination, for sovereignty, for human rights such a struggle. And for 60 years, Palestinians have alerted us to one outrage after another. Injustices piled upon injustices without the commensurate scale of global solidarity that is needed to make a difference a significant difference to their lives. But it is now in our hands. I think of people like Rachel Corey, like Tom Handal, and many others who we need to build on besides the thousands and thousands of Palestinian martyrs. And it's not by appealing to the ruling classes of the world and their institutions who remain in the face of abundant evidence, unmoved, callous, and hypocritical. By that, I don't mean we should not use institutions and multinational agencies when we can. When John Dugard, by the way, my country has given you the word apartheid, but it's also given you people like John Dugard, <laughs> like Archbishop Desmond Tutu. When John Dugard, in his statement to the Human Rights Council of the UN, talks about why a case can be made for Israel to be considered violating the suppression of the crime of apartheid, that particular piece that is not limited to South Africa but can be applied to any country, we need to use that document. So please don't misunderstand me. We need to use the resolutions. But we should also remain very clear that, in fact, these ruling classes are the ones that sustain, provide succor to Israeli apartheid and terror. And it is rather, rather by applying the most potent force, the most potent weapon, we have learned to rely on forged and steeled through tried and tested struggles of the workers and the oppressed people, spanning time and space, and that is solidarity. And I think Samora Machel, the president of Mozambique, the former liberation movement for Limo, who we believe was assassinated by the apartheid regime, said about solidarity, which we need to consider very seriously, he said it is not an act of charity, but an act of unity between allies fighting on different terrains towards the same objectives. And when people tell me in this city, Balboa, that it is Viola that has taken over the public transport system through privatization, there's a link there. There's a link between workers here and the oppressed in Palestine. When AMS docks, M docks, comes to South Africa or intends to come to South Africa because our parastatal in the telecommunications, Telcom, is privatizing and giving them an opening, there's a link. We are allies in that way as well. By the way, I'm glad to say that that move has been put on ice uh, because of pressure from the workers in our country, 
in telecom. Now, the second point I want to mention before talking about the lessons from the South African struggle is that the Palestinian struggle does not for many of us just exert a visceral tug, but a cold reading of imperialism shows that apartheid Israel is needed as a fundamentalist and militarized warrior state, not only to quell the undefeated and unbowed Palestinians, but also to act as a rapid font of reaction in concert with despotic Arab regimes to do the empire's bidding, not only in the Middle East, but beyond. So look at the role Israel has played over the years. Its support of the mass terror inflicted by the military regimes in Central and South America, its facilitation of the evasion of the international sanctions against apartheid South Africa, and we can go into detail about these links with apartheid South Africa at a nuclear level, at a security level, at a trade level, but also the role of the histradut in this equation. And it continues again. And we need to tell the European labor movement that the histradut is an agent of the apartheid Israeli regime. We have to recognize that the foundation of the Israeli economy is founded on the special political and military role which Zionism today, then and today, fulfills for Western imperialism. So while playing its role in ensuring that the region is safe for the oil companies, it's also carved out today a niche market producing high-tech security essential for the day-to-day -day functioning of new imperialism, a point that hasn't really come out in the conference. Now, I think that in the light of the killings and the slow starvation, correctly called genocide, of the inhabitants of Gaza, as well as the frequent incursions into the West Bank, but also the obsequiousness of some, that obsequiousness becomes all the more abject. So the fanfare and the din surrounding the Annapolis breakthrough the other day must be exposed. And so I agree with the previous speakers who talked about this industry called the peace process industry, also relating it to the Holocaust industry, where, which Norman Finkelstein so very uh, adequately exposed. And Kama Nabulsi had the best response that I saw a few days after Annapolis. And she's been vindicated once again. All those who have exposed the Oslo Accords, etc., as a distraction from the task of the international solidarity movement. And Kama said, the tarnished trickery of those tired catchphrases, last chance for peace, painful compromises, moderates against extremists, is now worn so thin a child would not be deceived. It is a meeting to legitimate the status quo. There is an intense defeatism pervading the mainstream media and tired politicians without valor everywhere. She concludes by, by saying, and this is the significant point, but there is a hopeful reality. Many ordinary citizens all over the world have not given up, and the Palestinians have not given up themselves. And I think we need to take a leaf from the creativity. These are not just victims. When so many hundreds of thousands of people broke down that barrier between Egypt and the Gaza that showed creativity, 
It showed the continuing fighting spirit of the Palestinians. And metaphorically, it shows that obstacles can be surmounted. And we need to be inspired by that practice. Now I want to draw a few lessons from the South African struggle in the limited time I, had, I have. First, it took a few decades of hard work before the boycott campaign could make an impact. Today you find people throughout the world, even Dick Cheney who called Nelson Mandela a terrorist and he must stay in Robben Island, all of them now are suddenly anti-apartheid. That was not the case. It was a few brave individuals starting in 1959 when the anti-apartheid movement came into being who did a lot of groundwork together with their allies throughout uh, the world that the boycott campaign began to bite. And of course, the f this first significant breakthrough came in 1963 when Danish dock workers refused to offload South African uh, goods. But it is true. I don't want to gloss over the context. It was another context, another historical situation. And the rise of the anti-apartheid movement must be seen in the general effervescence of liberation struggles in different parts of the world, social movements in the turbulent 1960s and early 70s, and in that context where there was, in whatever our opinion of the USSR and its motivations, a counterweight to the US hegemon. And this together with the viciousness of the pro-Israeli lobby, its opportunistic references to the Holocaust and anti-Semitism, and the post-9-11 climate of fear, silencing dissent and Islamophobia, makes the task of isolating apartheid Israel more difficult. But despite all that they have been throwing at us, and as Norman has said already, the gains they have is very few considering the resources they've deployed. And yet on our side, despite the seemingly daunting obstacles, the movement of BDS against Israel is gaining momentum. Tomorrow we will talk about all the trade unions, Kosatu, many other places in Ireland, We'll talk about the many instances there's people from the Scottish PSC will talk about their struggles, many, a lot of creativity being shown around the world. And I think that the move of Palestinian civil society, political parties, faith-based organizations, women's groups, trade unions, to form this overall body, the PNC, is a very important step forward. I think Omar is tired of us whenever we have a problem, should we boycott this person or not? We contact Omar. You know, in the before email we would have had a direct red phone to each other. But I think it's also something we are finding out in the process of struggle. And sometimes it can get messy and we can make mistakes like we made in the campaign against uh, apartheid South Africa. And I want to talk about that as well. But the other point I want to say is that the arguments used to oppose the boycott related to the harm it would cause black South Africans, there won't be jobs, etc., the need for dialogue and constructive engagement, these arguments have come to the fore again. The need for normalization and dialogue. I think we need to distinguish between the brave fighters that we have, both Arab and Jewish people in Palestine, Israel, and those who want to create a normalization in order to delay the victory of the Palestinian people. I think there is an important distinction and we should not confuse the two. And we, we easily rebuffed 
many of the apartheid regime's arguments and their supporters by lucid and knowledgeable arguments, not just by emotion. The South African regime, like the Israeli regime today, used homeland leaders an assortment of collaborators to argue the case for them. So careful research played an important role in exposing the economic, cultural, armaments trade links with South Africa to make our actions much more effective, as well as to name and shame those who benefited from the apartheid regime. Remember the boycott of artists who went to Sun City the Bantustan, which we call Sin City, uh, for a particular reason. Um, but I think we have the collective wisdom. We have people who have the expertise, who have done the research, who know about these links, who need to share it, and we need to publicize this as best as we can. Thirdly, sectarianism is a danger that we must be vigilant about and principled unity should be our lotus star. We made a number of mistakes in South Africa, and we can, I can give you the details later on. I think the healthy linking of struggles against uh, uh, oppressors wherever they are is important. I spent a year in Canada recently at the university, and I was very impressed by the group there, the Coalition Against Israeli Apartheid, and how they were able to make links between the Palestinian struggle and the indigenous people of uh, North America. I'll give you an example. In South Africa, we had a huge Palestinian solidarity rally recently, and members of the Palestine Solidarity Committee were asked by officials from the Palestinian, the PA, rather, ambassador, uh, uh, office in, uh, in, in Pretoria to pull down the flag of the Western Sawari uh, Republic because they feared this would alienate the ambassador of Morocco. And of course we refused the, this request much to the glee of uh, the supporters of the Polisario Front. But I think this linking of struggles is very important. Workers who are facing loss of jobs through privatization and the role of these companies like Viola and others. But lastly, the campaign for the BDS must be in concert with supporting grassroots organizations in Palestine as a whole and in the Palestinian diaspora. And this can take many Forms And we've started already. We have very significant groups here, Badil, Stop the Wall, many others, Pingo, both in the occupied territories and the 48 area. And I think that those relationships must be deepened. I want to end by saying that there are some who asked me to talk about apartheid, what it was, what were the laws, the similarities? I'm afraid we don't have the time to do that. It's an important discussion. There are significant differences, as some have pointed out, but many similarities which people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu, John Dugard, Ronnie Casserles, who uh, will be touring North America and the UK, uh, he's our former minister in, in the government. He's coming to Spain end of this month and coming to Spain, people like him, people like Eddie McHugh, another great fighter against apartheid, who's the general secretary of the South African Council of Churches, who's presently visiting African-American churches, which is very significant. That is happening all the time. We got Azmi Bishara to Soweto during the beginning of Israeli Apartheid Week last year deliberately, and our slogan was, silenced in Israel, speaks in Soweto. And the idea was not just to talk about the West Bank and Gaza, which we must continue doing, but also to make the link with people in the 48 area as well. And Ronnie Casserles, in turn, will be going to open the Israeli Apartheid Week. And I am 
very keen that the Basque country and the rest of Spain must be involved in Israeli Apartheid Week. The universities here have to have a program. Last year, there were close to 30 countries that took part in this, and this shocked the Zionists. From the University Kama Nabulsi goes to Oxford, to many other prestigious universities, they took a stand. And this shock, this coordination is what we want. Pasina, and uh, I come from a number of social movements in South Africa. Um, and I think that when I look at you, the grim determination. Uh, to stay here with us, the tenacity you have shown with a dollop of humor uh, is a very good sign because we're going to need all of that in the years to come uh, in this struggle. Uh, but uh, to empathize with uh, Paul, um, I'll, I'll, I'll take off where he stops. So I'll say, Viva, Viva Palestina! Viva, Viva! I can't hear you. Viva, viva Palestina! Viva, viva Palestina! Much better. Uh, we were talking about 2001 in Durban, and uh, uh, descendants of slaves uh, in North America, and this shocked the ruling classes of the world. It shocked them. Unfortunately, 9-11 happened. But that particular moment is something we must treasure. We need to counter, we need to counter the rubbish that has been written about Durban as if it was an anti-Semitic hate fest. That's the favored phrase that it's used. In fact, it was the festival of the oppressed throughout the world who deliberately and consciously put the struggle of the Palestinian people on the top. Uh, Durban was a very important lesson for the movement because there we saw, and there are few people here who can attest to that, who are with us on the streets of Durban. There were people from the West Bank, Gaza, uh, even the Syrian Heights or Golan Heights. There were people from 48. Uh, Palestine, there were people from the region, the Palestinian diaspora, who literally held hands with South Africans, uh, who empathized with the Palestinian struggle, but also with oppressed people and their allies throughout the world, uh, whether it was Dalits from India, the Roma from Europe, uh, peasants from South America. I think that there are many people here who I've wanted to meet for a long time, but uh, did not have the opportunity to meet. Uh, for example, on my left, uh, Umar Barghouti, we've been corresponding for a long, long time. And uh, we were convinced that we would meet each other a few years ago when the Association of American University Professors invited us to debate with others the issue of the academic boycott. But unfortunately, uh, the boycotters were boycotted by the donor agencies, Rockefeller, Ford, and, and uh, Nathan Cummings uh, uh, Foundation. Um, but it's something we'll talk about uh, tomorrow. And I think Judith Butler, who I think is one of uh, uh, my favorite philosophers, uh, has written extensively uh, about these donor agencies as well. And I think there's a lesson there for groups in Europe from what I've been hearing in the past two days and strategies to counter this. Um, I also completely empathize with uh, uh, Paul. Uh, he's been trying to get people to stand up and chant slogans. You know, we, we both come from social movements uh, via...